So I invite you, go in your Bible to Esther chapter 3. That's where our study will be this morning. The struggle for power at the expense of human lives and the hatred that leads to murder that burns inside of all of fallen man. The struggle is real, and it goes all the way back to the first family. It goes all the way back to Adam and Eve's sin, and their first child was a murderer. So on a political note, when people make comments, when tragedies happen, and they say, look at the environment that that person was brought up in, it's hogwash. Cain was in the first family, and he was a murderer. He wasn't from a ghetto. He wasn't uneducated and underprivileged. He was in the first family, and his heart bore out a hatred against God. And he killed his brother. The depravity of man is displayed in the heart's desire to be number one. That's the root problem of every conflict in marriage. I will be number one. No, not over me, you won't. Oh, yes, I will. Every parent-child relationship, every issue within a family, workplace, community, and even within a church is who will reign supreme. And the propensity of our hearts is I will. It's my way. And no one will tell me and mine what to do. This has been since the beginning of time that humanity struggles for the power that seeks to usurp the place of God in the lives of fellow human beings. And not only that, but it also manifests itself as an urge to resist righteous authority that has been ordained by God. We don't have to teach our kids to rebel against their parents. They come from the womb knowing how to do that. Don't you do that. No. Right? They, they'll do it. And, and that, that's just something we're born with. That's a human nature, a fallen nature. Parents, governments, church authority. In us is this without Christ, without the redeeming grace of God, we fight it. We don't want it. You're not going to tell me what to do. What, what thoughts or what images come to your mind when you hear the following list of names, listen to these individuals. Listen to Herod the Great, Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, Benito Mussolini, Fidel Castro, Saddam Hussein, Osama bin Laden, Kim Jong-il, Ali Khamenei, the supreme leader of Iran. When you hear these names, they're unified with the title of the sermon. There is a place for notes on the back of today's worship guide. Here in Esther chapter 3, we see the king, King Ahasuerus, he promotes a despot. That's a word you use all the time, right? A despot. What's the definition of this term? It's a powerful ruler. One who holds absolute power, typically one who exercises it, this power, in a cruel or oppressive way. And of the men that I mentioned, that list, including Hitler and Stalin and on, Many of them are united around a satanic theme, and that is to annihilate the people of Israel. To get rid of all Jewish people. Words like tyrant, oppressor, dictator, slave driver. That's a, that's a despot. That's a despotic leader. He's a tyrant. That, ladies and gentlemen, is Haman that Esther 3 introduces us to. And Haman is exalted. He gets a promotion. He's a wicked ruler, and he's given complete authority by King Ahasuerus in the entire Persian kingdom. This, this promotion is foolish. It's by the king, and it's going to threaten the very life of his queen along with all of her people, but he didn't think that far in advance and he didn't do very good at investigating the claims brought against a certain people who are in your kingdom, were the words of Haman. Now, Esther and Mordecai, they're in a foreign land, but God in his providence is going to use them for his glory to save his people. And last week, if you were here, I had a visual aid of a board, nails, and a hammer. 
And all throughout the kingdom, King Ahasuerus is setting laws, bossing people around, ordering people around, telling people what to do. Every, you can drink. You can drink as much as you want to, and I'll make a law that you don't have to drink if you don't want to. He is taking care of every little detail, except last week he didn't know that he was about to be assassinated. Mordecai saved his life. Chapter 2 ends, and it just fades into nothing happened. And chapter 3 unfolds with the promotion. But God is provident. Divine providence is a fundamental article of the Christian faith. The Puritan Arthur Dent, he died in 1607, he wrote this. For every one of us, when we do confess God to be almighty, do acknowledge that he by his providence rules everything. That's what it means to be provident. Rules over everything. The Heidelberg Catechism it offers helpful explanation of divine providence. There's a question number 27, and this is the question. What dost thou mean by the providence of God? When we talk about the providence of God, what are we talking about? This is the answer. The almighty and everywhere present power of God, whereby, as it were by his hand, he upholds and governs heaven, earth, and all creatures, so that herbs and grass, rain and drought, Fruitful and barren years, meat and drink, health and sickness, riches and poverty, yea, and all things come, not by chance, but by his fatherly hand. So the question that would follow this up is, so what does that mean? What, what good is that for us? If everything, you're, if everything is, happens by the providence of God, how is that good for his people? How is that good for all people? And that's question 28. What advantage is it to us to know that God has created and by his providence does still uphold all things? Here's the answer. That we may be patient in adversity, thankful in prosperity, and that in all things which may hereafter befall us, we place our firm trust in our faithful God and Father that nothing shall separate us from his love since all creatures are so in his hand that without his will they cannot so much as move. Every creature, every bug, every speck in the entire universe can't exist or move or have its being, but that God is not provident over every single thing. That's what we mean by providence. So like Esther and Mordecai, who lived 2,500 years ago and died, we also have been born for such a time as this. You are here on planet Earth for a reason for such a time as this. God placed you here for a reason. And I'm wondering, do you understand? And it's not just to live, work, and die. It's not to just eat, drink, and vacation and die. Everybody does that. Non-believers do that. They do it really well. That's not why you're here, child of God. So I'm praying that this message, the word of God, the living word of God, will penetrate your heart. And if you're living aimlessly, that after today, that will never be said of you again in your life, but that you will understand God is provident. He brought me here under this message because he's good. And he had a word for me. For such a time as this, see the pressure? The pressure is to blend in. The pressure is that you just go with the flow. We, we pray for our politicians because that's an unbelievable amount of pressure when elected to now you're elected, now just become like everybody else. Go with the flow. Don't mess with things, just leave it alone. But we believe that as people of community, we exist to glorify God. We exist to glorify God, to reach people for Jesus Christ, to connect them with other believers, to equip them to grow in their faith so that they can serve him. That's why we're here. That's why you're here this morning. You believe that. I want to glorify God. 
I want to glorify him in how I sing to him. I want to glorify him in my giving to him. I want to glorify him in my serving him. Every aspect of my life, I, Lord, I want to be glorified in me. Oh, I pray that that is your prayer. Because that is our purpose, we will therefore gladly be spent and spend our lives for the glory of this king. This eternal, everlasting, good king who is our father. Esther chapter 3. I'm going to go through this account and read the entire account. And then I'm going to give us some application this morning as we break this down of how can we trust God? How do we trust God when, when really when things go wrong and we rely on his providence and we rest in him? Some of you are desperately in need of rest. Look, look at this. Let the word of God speak to you because the word of God can do what I can't do, can do what no counselor can do. The word of God gets all the way in. It penetrates the deep recesses of the heart and the soul. After these things, Esther chapter 3, verse 1, after these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman. So right there in a Jewish home, all the kids say, boo. Right? He's, the, he's the villain. They hate him. They don't like him. He's the bad guy, all right? The son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes who were with him. And all the king's servants who were within the king's gate bowed and paid homage to Haman, for so the king had commanded him, commanding, concerning him. But Mordecai would not bow or pay homage. Then the king's servants who were within the king's gate said to Mordecai, why do you transgress the king's command? Notice they didn't ask him, why don't you bow? They said, why, don't you, why do you transgress the king's command? Now it happened. When they spoke to him daily or day by day or day after day, day after day, day after day, and he would not listen to them, that they told it to Haman to see whether Mordecai's words would stand. For Mordecai had told them that he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow or pay, homage, pay him homage, Haman was filled with wrath. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had told him of the people of Mordecai. Instead, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, the people of Mordecai. In the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of, the king, of king Ahasuerus, they cast pur, that is, the lot, before Haman, to determine the day and the month until it fell on the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar. Then Haman said to king Ahasuerus, there is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from all other peoples, and they do not keep the king's laws. Therefore, it is not fitting for the king to let them remain. If it pleases the king, let a decree be written that they be destroyed. And I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who do the work to bring it into the king's treasuries. So the king took a, his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. And the king said to Haman, the money and the people are given to you to do with them as it seems good to you. Then the king's scribes were called on the 13th day of the first month, and a decree was written according to all that Haman commanded to the, to the king's satraps, to the governors, who were over each province, to the officials of all people, to every province according to its script, and to every people in their language, in the name of King Ahasuerus, it was written and sealed with the king's signet ring. And the letters were sent by couriers into all the king's provinces, to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all the Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day, on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their possessions. A copy of the document was to be issued as law in every province being published for all people that they should be ready for that day. The couriers went out, hastened by the king's command, and the decree was proclaimed in Shushan the citadel. So the king and Haman sat down to drink. But the city of Shushan was perplexed. 
Let's pray. Lord, we ask you now for your help. As we come to your word, be our teacher. Father, I pray that you will take your living, powerful, lasting, indestructible word, your word that does not fade away, that your, your word that will be fulfilled, that is true. Father, I pray that you would use your word to conform us into the image of your dear son. For Jesus' sake, amen. So this morning, from this account, Esther chapter 3, Haman's appointment. King Ahasuerus appoints Haman. What are we going to learn? What do we need to recognize? I need to recognize that God is in complete control. He is provident. And I need to rely. I need to rest in him with the outcome. When, number one, the wrong person is exalted. We see that in verse one. When the wrong person is exalted, the wrong person, you were up for that promotion. You were up for that place. You, you were the next in line and you got passed over in the other person. They got it. And you know, they're a horrible worker. They're lazy. They're not even honest. They're the worst thing for the company and they got the promotion and you were overlooked. Am I ringing any bells here, right? This is, this is where we live. This is what happened to Mordecai. The temptation when this happens, it's real. And it's the temptation for us to be bitter, to be jealous, to be envious, to be covetous. Why'd you, why'd you let them happen, God? Here I am, I'm serving, I give some of my money, I even do some stuff, and, and, and you let that happen? Well, see, chapter two ends, Mordecai saves the king's life. And it just ends. Written that, make sure you write that down, get that written down, save my life, good. And life goes on. This is about four years later now. Mordecai has gone on serving the king in the king's gate. Four years, nobody said anything about you saved the king's life. Is that coincidental? No. Not at all. Just Mordecai was overlooked because God is provident in his being held back for the time being. Chapter 3 opens up. Here's Haman the Agagite. The struggle between the people of Haman and the people of Mordecai was centuries old. It goes all the way back to Exodus 17. Moses leading the children of Israel out of Egypt. Can we come through your land? No. And the Amalekites attack Israel. All the men and women and children, they're, like, they're just moving through the wilderness and out comes ISIS. Okay? This is, this is the wicked people. And God says, I'll be back for you. And who, who does he come back with but King Saul in 1 Samuel 15? Okay, Saul, today's the day. You're going to go wipe out the Amalekites. I promised that this would happen. Now is the time. Go do it. And you remember, Saul disobeys, and he saves King Agag alive. What is, what is his motive? Does he want the king's ransom? You can get a lot of money for a king. He saves him alive. He disobeys. It doesn't matter what his motive. He disobeyed the Lord. And so here we meet them again, only now they're in Persia. They're in a different land. But this rivalry, this hatred is not gone. It's still there. And don't you know, if you're mad at someone, how that hatred can abide it can just remain and stick and fester and it just brews inside of you unless the cross deals with it. Unless you take it to the cross and you realize, whoa, the love that God has displayed on me, how am I holding against them? They owe me nickels on the dot. They don't owe me anything compared to what I've done against God. Here we see this old hatred. Haman was advanced. He was given a throne, the Bible says. His advancement, his throne, was above all the princes who were with him. He's the number two leader in the land. Go back with me to Genesis chapter 41. The writer of Esther does not tell us, well, what does that mean? What's, what, what are all the perks and the privileges that come with that promotion? But Genesis does. When Pharaoh promotes Joseph... He spells it out. This is what I mean when I say, Joseph, you're the guy. Genesis chapter 41, look at verse 37. So the advice was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all the servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find such a one as this, a man in whom, in whom is the spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. 
Then Pharaoh, now watch this, took his signet ring off his hand and put it on Joseph's hand. And he clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. And he had him ride in the second chariot, which he had. And they cried out before him, bow the knee. So he set him over all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh also said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh. And without your consent, no man may lift his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. Changed his name, put him in, he installed him. So we go back to Esther. Ahasuerus is not just king over Egypt. Ahasuerus is king of the world. The entire Persian empire is his. And he has elevated Haman, this wicked man. That didn't sit well with Mordecai. Undoubtedly, Mordecai probably thought of Psalm 73, when the wicked advance, and have I cleansed my hands in vain? In Psalm 73, the psalmist says, and I was thinking like a dog, like a fool, until I went into the house of the Lord. Mordecai is in a distant land. He can't go. He's a foreign land. He can't go into the house of the Lord. He can remember the word of the Lord, but he can't go to the Lord's house. He's out of fellowship. And God is working through all of the conflict and all of the trials to bring about the salvation of his people. He's provident. You see, when Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers, he was seduced by Potiphar's wife and then lied about and sent, sentenced to prison. He was forgotten in prison for two years, left there. But when Joseph was elevated to power, all of the people of Egypt and the world then were, were saved. It was a good thing for Joseph to get the ring of Pharaoh because Joseph feared God. When Haman gets exalted, the people are scared in the land. They don't know what's coming next. He just handed over the reins to a madman, a crazy individual, an egotistical, self-centered, can't get enough of himself. Now, when you think about this, when dictators go into places, what do they do? They put images of themselves everywhere. Everywhere you go is pictures of, they build me, here I am, King Nebuchadnezzar, here's my statue, worship me, all of these things. Why? They're setting themselves forward as, I am to be feared and worshipped. God is in control. And you and I must learn to trust Him completely and rest in Him and in His providence when the wrong person, even a wicked person, is exalted. Number two, when it's time to take a stand. See, when it's time to take a stand, it's tempting for us to make excuses rather than put it all on the line. I can make excuses and so can you. Well, I was going to share the gospel with them, but, well, I might lose my job if. This is where we live. All the king's officials bowed down when Haman passed by. They all honored him. This wicked man, this despot. The king commanded Everybody will worship him, just like Pharaoh did for Joseph. Everybody worship him, bow down, give him honor. So to, dis, to dishonor Haman was dishonoring the king. If you didn't bow before Haman, the king said bow before Haman. So if you didn't bow before Haman, you were rebelling against King Ahasuerus. This is a big deal. Do you remember the last person in Esther that rebelled against King Ahasuerus? It was Vashti. And the king said, come and show yourself off. This is, she's mine. And she said, I'm not doing it. Banish her. May have even executed her, deposed her, done with her. And here we see Mordecai, and he's making a stand. He's been pushed. Now it's time. He will not bow down. He will not pay homage to Haman. Now, when the three Hebrew children, when they bowed down, it was a direct obedience to the word of the Lord, the command of God. That's an idol. God said, don't bow to idols. We're not bowing. And everybody else on the plane was looking at the three Hebrew children saying, what are you doing? The king said, bow. And they said, we're not going to bow. You'll get thrown in the fiery furnace. We're not going to bow. We're standing here. And you should be standing too. I'm not going to die today. Well, you remember the account? If we die today... The Lord's going to deliver us either way out of your hand, O king, but no matter what, strike that band up one more time. We're not going to bow to your idol. 
Okay, that was a, a bold stand on a clear command of God. Here Mordecai is, and he's not bowing before Haman. It's interesting when we look at this. He would have already bowed before the king, or he wouldn't be in this position. He's not like Daniel and the three Hebrew children here. Queen Esther, coming soon, will prostrate herself before the king on behalf of her people. So the text fills in for us. It helps us understand, why is Mordecai so ticked off? Why has he come to his breaking point when he says, that's it. I've been pushed as far as I can be pushed. I'm not bowing to that guy. What is it? It's in there twice, verse 1 and verse 10. This is Haman, the son of Hamadetha, the Agagite. I'm not bowing before that guy. I'm not going to bow. I'm not going to humble myself. I'm not going to honor that individual. So think about this. How many compromises has Mordecai already made to fit in in the Persian kingdom? He's in the king's gate, just like Lot was in the gate of Sodom. Mordecai is in the king's gate. Mordecai could have drawn the line like Daniel did. I'm not eating the king's meal. I'm not eating his provision because I'm a Hebrew and I'm not going to eat that. We don't see any account of that. Mordecai, he could have left Susa when the edict was given and you can leave. He could have gone home. He didn't leave. He stayed. He didn't draw the line there. We need help. We're going home to build a temple. Everybody, come on. No. We're going forward by faith. No, not me. Good luck with that. Mordecai hasn't drawn a line there. He's missing out on God's blessing. Mordecai, he could have taken a clear stance when Esther's called, come on, the king wants you. You're beautiful. Mordecai could have said, no, 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 you don't understand. We're Hebrews, we're Jews, and we can't give our daughters in marriage to pagan, even if it's a pagan king. He's a heathen. We can't do that. He could have drawn a line there. He didn't. He didn't draw a line in any of those places. Are there ways where we can be like Mordecai? Even like the Pharisees in Jesus' day, who Jesus said, you strain at gnats and you swallow camels. Well, that's an indictment. One writer brings this introspection close to home. He says this, what a vivid picture of many of our churches. We are expert gnat strainers, sieving out with precision wrong movies, the inappropriate clothes and hairstyles, the sinful styles of music, any minor deviances from traditional church practice, wherever and whenever we encounter them, yet at the same time, we may easily tolerate in ourselves and those around us camel-sized sins, such as gossip about others, or pride in our own accomplishments, or prayerlessness. You and I must come to realize God is in control. He's provident. He's sovereign. He's good. And I have to trust him and I have to rest in his plan when the wrong person is exalted and when it's time to take a stand. And thirdly, when someone close to me betrays my trust. We see this in verses three and four. When someone close to me betrays my trust, what's the temptation there? When someone betrays you, someone that you trusted, someone that you, you thought they loved you and they betrayed you, they cheated on you, they were unfaithful to you, they lied to you, how do you respond to this individual who promised you, oh, I'll never do that again, and a few hours later, their word is trampled in the dust? Well, it's tempting to move into isolation or to retaliate in like manner. Well, they did that to me? I quit. I'll go into the hole. I'll go into isolation. I'm not going to church. Just withdraw. Go into isolation. Not solitude, getting alone with God. I'm talking pulling away from the people. Well, they betrayed me. Or, oh yeah, you got me? Then I'm going to get you back. You went after me, now I'm going to go after you. And I'm going to pull an entourage with me, and we're going to take you down. That's the temptation. The court officials, verses 3 and 4. The king's servants, they observed Mordecai's resistance, but they didn't know why he was refusing to bow. Here's another tidbit. This is another glimpse of why we're saying Mordecai was not like Daniel. He was not like the three Hebrew children. They didn't know why he wasn't bowing. 
He stood there, and day after day, Haman went by, and he just stood there. What's the matter with you? Why aren't you bowing? The king said, bow. Not going to bow. They didn't know why. Day after day, they bugged him. He wouldn't listen to them. Just walk off. That's how he dealt with the problem. Just walked away until finally he could walk away from it. Some of you deal with problems that way. You just walk away from it. Walk away from it. Conflict in marriage, conflict in parenting, conflict at work, and you just walk away. You just run. That's what Mordecai's doing here. He's not taking it head on and dealing with it, but he's been brought to a point in his mind. He's like, I, I have to make a stand, but I'm not all the way in there yet. I'm not all the way forward yet. At some point, Mordecai gave into their persistent barrage and he gave them the backstory. Verse 4 says, Mordecai had told them that he was a Jew. Perhaps Mordecai thought, you know what? All right, fine. I'm going to tell these guys. I work with them every day. I'm with them every day. I'm going to tell them why I won't bow and then they'll leave me alone. I'm tired of this. So at some point, Mordecai says, listen, all right, fine. Haman's up the line. Amalek, the Amalekites, Israel, battle. They came out, attacked us. Saul was supposed to kill them. That's my heritage. I'm from Saul. I'm in a, actually a royal family line that was discontinued by the Lord. And he's in this other line. We have a royal line. And we got this long battle brewing. And the Lord said he's going to be done with them. And right now, you know, I, I'm not going to bow to him. So what do they do? They go right to Haman. Hey, Haman, how you doing? Bow before you? Yep, you're great. Um, did you notice there's a guy over there, Mordecai? And he doesn't ever bow to you? Do you see him? Somebody's not bowing to me? This guy's been drinking it in all along. Haman, Haman. And he rides in the chariot. He's just a man. And now they tell him, one guy in the Persian kingdom isn't bowing to you, and he's done. Stick a fork in him. He's livid. He's filled with wrath. He's angry. This is horrible. So Mordecai's been betrayed. And they went, do you realize... They're wanting to see, will your words stand? You're standing. Now, how about your words? Is your word going to stand up against the king? Because Vashti's word didn't stand up against the king. You've taken a stand against the king. Let's see if your word stands like you are, big fella. It's a play on words there in the Hebrew. It's an emphasis there. See, Esther, up until this point, Esther, four, four years. She's been obedient to Mordecai's command. Don't tell anybody you're a Jew. Okay, she hasn't. Now Mordecai's pushed to the brink and finally says, it's because I'm a Jew. He's broken his own advice. He just can't take it anymore. Mordecai's stance is going to expose himself, Esther, whom he loves dearly, and all of his people. And not just in the Persian kingdom, because the Persian kingdom includes where, where the temple is being built. So there's nowhere to go. This is everybody. This is every Jew. Let me ask you the question. What stand have you taken in life? What have you taken a stand on? I mean, really a clear-cut stand. The people around you at work, do they, do they know you're a follower of Christ? Do they know where you stand with God? Have you taken a stand for essential things or peripheral matters? Most churches, they divide over nothings, not over substantive doctrinal issues. If you refused to bow, if you do take a stand, here's a good question to think. What's at risk? Mordecai took a stand, and immediately he put his own life at risk. He put Esther's life at risk, and all of his people everywhere at risk. He didn't know he was doing that. He was simply not, I'm not bowing to that guy. If you do take a stand, have you counted the cost? What is at risk? If you live in a surrendered way to the Lord, what's gonna, what relationship is going to, it may be over, it may be done. Because that person is going to say, what are you, a Jesus freak? Uh, I'm not, I didn't sign up for that. Will you really believe this book? Are you going to obey it? No. I, I really want. What, what is it going to cost you? Mordecai didn't realize the full intensity of, of what was coming as a repercussion of his decision to take a stand, but it was right. Listen, if you're here this morning, and you're doing an outstanding job at blending in, what might God use 
to withdraw the culture from around you to leave you exposed as a child of his? That is what God is doing to Mordecai and Esther. They haven't taken a stand on their own, and so God is he's pulling the culture down around them to leave them standing there. Oh, I didn't really intend to make this kind of a stand, but now that I've made the stand, no, I'm not going to bow. I'm going to stand. God is in control. He's provident. And you and I must learn to trust in Him and rest in Him when the wrong person is exalted, when it's time to take a stand, when someone close to you betrays your trust, and fourthly, when the people of God are threatened with death. The Bible says, for your sakes we are being killed all the day long. Our brothers and sisters around the world are being, their heads are being cut off. They're being burned alive. I read this week of the, of the ISIS dipping and killing traitors, informants in acid. That wasn't something I believe done to Christians. I don't know if there were any Christians in that number. But our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world are being put to death daily do we think of that? See, the temptation is to turn away. To see that, well, that's a nice point. Thank you, Pastor. The people of God are threatened with death. But you know, that's really not going to come here. So I just got to make sure I get my kid through high school, get him through college, get him a good job, get him married. You know, just get him a good life. Really? What might God use to expose you as a child of his instead of just another person living on planet Earth and you happen to be a citizen of the United States of America? See, the temptation for us is to turn away from those who are at risk, from those who are dying and live like, well, that could never happen here. That'll never happen to me. That'll never happen to us. It's not my problem. Haman finally saw what had been going on day after day, and it made him angry. Immediately, he's filled with wrath, verse 5 says. All the pride, all the joy, all of that, it's over when one guy doesn't bow to him. It's done. There are people like that. So much can be going well. One thing is not out of, you know, one person says, you know, I think you should rethink how you're doing this, and it, it's over. They're, they're done. But here we see how wicked Haman is because he delays in verse 6 dealing with Mordecai individually so that he can use his exalted position to inflict as much collateral damage as possible on him and all of his people the whole entire race. In verse 7, Haman consults the gods, they roll the dice. Checks the morning horoscope. It's not what a believer does, but that's what Haman does. You shouldn't do that. We don't consult the stars. We don't go to palm readers. That's what Haman does. That's wickedness. They cast per the lots, the lot. They cast the lot. He gathers the diviners, to get the diviners together. They checked it all out. Here's what we can say. And they roll the dice and they roll the dice. Four years have passed. We see that in verse 7. From the time Mordecai saved the king's life, nothing has been done for him yet. Now it's the first month. It's the month of Nisan. It's the 12th year of King Ahasuerus. New Year's Day was an appropriate day for Haman's div divination because in the Babylonian religion, that was the day when the gods came together to fix the fate of men. Okay, so we have New Year's parades and New Year's celebration and football. They had, that's the day when the gods fixed the fate of humanity. That's the day we're going to fix the fate of the Jewish race. <coughs> Proverbs 16, verse 33 says, The lot is cast in the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. The plan for this day of death would be nearly one year later until it fell on the 12th month, which, with, which is the month of Adar. The Jews have a death sentence coming upon them, and they have nearly a year to think about it. They can't escape. They can't go anywhere. They can't go home. That's part of the Persian kingdom. They don't have the resources to mount against an, an army and an attack against Ahasuerus. This isn't time to, to put your support together and see what we can do. This is a countdown to our death sentence. 11 months, 10 months, nine, count it down. This is the day we're going to die. Haman's case 
against the people is laid out in verse 8 and 9. It's very limited. It, it, he doesn't really say a lot. Uh, there's a certain people scattered, dispersed among the people in the provinces of your kingdom. You got a problem, king. You probably didn't know about it, but hey, don't worry. You appointed me. I got your back. We'll take care of it. Just trust me. That's a paraphrase, but that's what he's saying. And the king says, oh, okay, take care of that problem for me. What's his claim against the Jews? Well, king, their laws are different from all other peoples. That's true, but it's incomplete. What laws? What are you talking about, Haman? He doesn't ask. He doesn't investigate anything. He just says, oh, really? Their laws are different? I have someone with different laws? Well, I'm the king. It's my law. I'm the one that directs everybody, go here, go there, do this, do that. How much? Man, there's people with different laws? <gasps> no, surely you jest. That can't be in my kingdom. And he lays it out. He says, oh, by the way, let's take this up a notch. They don't keep the king's laws. What's the evidence? There's no evidence given. He doesn't surrender any evidence. It's a false accusation with zero evidence. Do you know of any other Jews who were falsely maligned, accused of breaking laws that weren't laws of God? That would be Jesus. This is a satanic a threat against a race of people through whom God has promised Messiah. This isn't just Mordecai, Haman, Mordecai, Azuerus. This is Satan trying to thwart the plan of God. But Satan is not God. The solution to the king's problem, I thought this all out, king. It's a good thing you appointed me. So it's not fitting for the king to let them remain. You, you know what you got to do, king? You remember what you did to Vashti? You got to do that with these people. I'm your guy. I'll take care of it for you. That's exactly what he does. I mean, Herod, he was evil, but he only killed the baby boys under two in Bethlehem. That's bad enough, right? You wouldn't look at someone that, well, you know, they only killed the baby boys born in Richmond. They weren't that bad. There were a lot of other towns. No, you would say, that's somebody nasty. That's somebody evil. This guy's problem, we just got to wipe them all out. Every last one. The recommendation for this unnamed people, he hasn't even said who they are. He hasn't even named them as Jews. He says, you have a certain people. We've got to exterminate them. Verse 9, the recommendation for the execution of this plot, it's based on flattery, if it pleases the king. Let a, tree, let a decree be, I'm not going to tell you what to do, king, but if it pleases you, just write a, write a decree that they be destroyed. You know, you can do that. You're the king. You're in charge. They're not, come on, you can do this. Flattery, bribery. And you know what? Now, while we're on the matter, while we're on the subject, I'll put 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who do the work. And it'll be good for you. Don't worry about the tax base you're going to miss when you, you know, wipe out a race of people. We'll take care of it. The proposal of bribery nullifies the validity of the so-called threat. Why does he have to bribe if this is really a threat? Why does he have to bribe the king? This makes no sense. If you have a police officer and someone flies down forest doing 150 miles an hour, you're probably not going to have to go to the police officer and say, you know, we got this person that you just saw fly by at 150 miles an hour down forest, and um, what's it going to take? What's it going to take to go after them? I mean, I don't got anything in there, but uh, no, that's their job. If you have to pay a police officer to you see the car over there, yeah, you need to go check them out. Something's probably wrong. Immediately, bribery's involved. Something's desperately wrong. 10,000 talents. That's equal to over 300 tons of silver. That's approximately two-thirds of the empire's revenue in a year. Where's he going to get this money from? That's about 10 or $15 million today. Best estimates. Did Haman have that kind of money? Maybe. It was known of elite, wealthy. You think about Saudi, you think about kings, you think about princes. There is extreme wealth. It's possible he had those kind of resources. Possibly he's just making up a number to embellish to the king. The king didn't even ask. The king didn't even care. Haman is probably counting on all the wealth he will gain from the death of the Jews to pay the debt just like when Hitler 
confiscated all of the wealth of all the Jews when they went into all of those and they took them out of their homes. They took the home. They took all of their jewelry. They took all of the heirlooms. They took all of their money. They took everything and they put them into ghettos and they put them in concentration camps. camps and six million death of Jews later, six million died. And that wealth was transferred into the coffers of the earthly more powerful. Probably that's what Haman has in mind. The king signs off. Verses 10 through 14, still unnamed, doesn't know who these people are. He just hands the ring over. Uh, historians say this is April 7th, 474 BC. Ironically, when this edict is published, the Jews should have been celebrating Passover. As this is unfolding, they should have been celebrating Passover, remembering God delivered us from Egypt to our homeland, and we're not at home, and what are we doing in Persia? And this is ongoing, this is unfolding when they should have been remembering God. He is our deliverer. He rescued us and he will save us. Ahasuerus gives Haman total control. Verse 11, you got it all, all the people, whatever you need, here you go. And Ahasuerus issues and publishes Haman's Holocaust in verses 12 through 14, that they should be ready for that day. And historians have narrowed that down to March 7th, 473 BC. March 7th. D-Day, the day of execution of an entire race of people. That was Haman's plan. And Ahasuerus said, go ahead, knock yourself out. Here's my ring. God is in control. You and I must learn to trust him. Wrong person exalted, trust him then. When it's time to take a stand, take a stand and trust him. When someone close to you betrays you, take a stand, trust the Lord. God is provident over that. When the people of God are threatened with death, God is provident, God is in control, trust him and rest in his plan. And number five, the surrounding culture is thrown into complete state of confusion. Trust him then. Rely on his providence then. You see, the temptation is to crash and burn with the culture. If our identity is bound up in the culture, then that will happen. But if our identity is bound up in Jesus, then kingdoms come and kingdoms go. And presidents come and presidents go. And earthly rulers and monarchs come and they go. Jesus remains forever and we belong to Him. And we're part of His kingdom. It's a never-ending kingdom. So we legislate to this world from that kingdom that reigns over all kingdoms. And this is the rule book right here. We're his people. We're sealed by his spirit. We belong to him. We've been put by him into his body. We are not our own, the Bible says. We have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God. You belong to him. Glorify him. The whole surrounding culture may be thrown into a complete state of confusion. Rest in God's sovereignty. Rest in his providence. The couriers went out in a hurry, hastened by the king's command. There he is commanding again. Get it done. Go do it. We'll make Persia great again. Come on, here we go. Then the decree was proclaimed in Shushan the citadel. The king and Haman sat down to drink. Do you hear how disconnected this ruler is from his people? The whole city around his palace is thrown into complete confusion representative of the entire kingdom is on its, uh, they're upside down. They're all confused. They don't know what is going on. And what is he doing? Getting drunk with his newest buddy, Haman. He doesn't care. He could care less about what is going on and who are these people and why are we doing this and what's been the threat? What's the real threat? How are they disobeying? What law are they breaking? Nothing has been generated. He simply passes and says, come on, let's get back to the party now, Haman. How about that? Party, let's go. Serve it up. The city of Shushan was perplexed. Intense confusion was everywhere because of unanswered questions like, uh, what was the reason for the king's sudden, his sudden racism? What happened there? What, what, what did the Jews do to him? Questions like, um, what was the king's motive behind ordering a death penalty on all the Jewish people? Questions like, what are we going to do about all of our Jewish friends and co-workers? And some of them have married into our family. How are we going to deal with them? And now I have some grandchildren and 
my son married a Jewish daughter or my daughter married a Persian person and now, uh-oh, how, how, the whole empire is in upheaval because suddenly there's a king legislating a death penalty and they can't do anything. That's similar to what they experienced in Germany. When that edict was given and it said that as the railway cars would go by churches in Germany, that Christians in churches would simply sing louder to not hear the people screaming in the trains on their way to the concentration camps and the fires that awaited them. Okay, that's exactly what people are doing in Persia. What do we do? What do we do? Well, you know what happens if you tell the king no? He'll issue an edict against you. You want to die? You want your kids to die? You love your family, don't you? You wouldn't want to stand against the king, do you? But as I've said for several weeks now, this king, Ahasuerus, has been dead for 2,500 years. His kingdom is gone. And God orchestrated all of these events, all of the suffering, all of the persecution, all of the attitudes, the history, all of it, for the glory of God and the good of his people. And so it is that he is provident in your life and in my life. Every minute detail is ordered from the hand of a God who is provident and good and faithful. Do you understand that? Do you believe that? Because that is going to change how you operate and I operate in this world. If your father is a king, you're going to live differently. If you belong to the king of kings, you're going to see the world differently. Your hope isn't going to be bound up in a, in a mere culture that changes. They would be asking questions like, um, if the king is mad at the Jews right now, who's he going to be mad at next? He was mad at Vashti. That was his wife. And he banished her. Now he's mad at a whole race of people. What about us? Did you see how they had to translate it into all the languages? You don't think the other peoples in the other languages would not have been thinking, what if he gets mad at us? Let's try and float under the radar. And let's just not, hopefully he doesn't even know we're here. Because otherwise, he might try to kill us. Well, God is in complete control in your life and in my life when the wrong person is exalted when it's time to take a stand, when someone close to me betrays my trust, when the people of God are threatened with death, when the surrounding culture is thrown into complete state of confusion, God is providentially in control and orchestrating every little detail. So how do we apply this? How do we make sense of what Ahasuerus did and Haman and Mordecai and this, this whole mess that's going on here in, in Persia? The questions that we, we have to ask to, to work through this, to make, to make sense of the moral slide in, in our culture, what we're facing in today. Why did God allow a wicked man to be exalted instead of Mordecai? Don't you think it would have been easy to say, Lord, Really? You had Mordecai right there and you let Haman get there? I mean, Lord, I, I mean, I know I'm not God, but be careful. Be careful. Because we're right. We're not God. We're not. He is. So it works really well for you and for me to let God be God. Why would he do that? Well, there's a reason. He did it to cause his people to turn back to him and trust in him. He did it to, to show his people, to say to his people, stop living at home in a culture, in a land that's not yours. Go home, your home, the land I promised you, where the Redeemer will come, Messiah will come. Get there. Stop living like you belong. You don't belong in Persia. Go home. Some are tempted to live as if this world is your home. Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith or not. The Lord is telling them through this trial, return to me. Stop trusting in the provisions of an earthly king with an earthly kingdom. Trust in me. I'm the heavenly king with a kingdom that never ends. Trust in me. Another question, why would Ahasuerus let Haman issue a decree for genocide without any evidence? What have the Jewish people done to him? Answer, saved his life. 
Do you see how foolish this king is? He's just signed the death sentence with his own ring to the man who saved his life. This is the emperor with new clothes, which are actually no clothes. Run around the kingdom naked until the little kid says, Mom, that emperor doesn't have any clothes on. Shh! He's the emperor. We don't want to offend him. Here's a king who's a fool. He's a fool. And he's just given Nilly Willy, who, hey man, whatever you want to do, because I'm the guy who tells people what they can do and not do. And he just signed the death sentence to the one who saved his life. Wow. He was a weak, impetuous, unkind, uncaring, self-absorbed, greedy, and arrogant king. And he sure isn't alone in powerful positions of people who fit that bill right there. He's a wicked leader. And the Bible says, when the wicked reign, the people groan. So that's a bad king. Now let's direct our minds and hearts to the king of love. You see, beloved, this is the reality. God has far more reason to punish you and me than Ahasuerus did to punish the Jewish people. They saved his life. He had no reason to punish them. God has every reason to punish you and me in hell forever because we have all sinned. We have all rebelled against the king of kings. We rightfully deserve his gavel to drop and say, you go to hell forever because we've all rebelled against him. But he didn't do that. He sent his son, far more precious than the ring that Ahasuerus pawned off to Haman. He sent his son, and his son, Jesus, came, lived a sinless life, went to the cross, laid down his life, let us, the ones he made, he created, crucify him, spit on him, betray him, malign him, lie about him. He bore the wrath of God for sinners on Calvary's tree. And there, in, in 2,500 years ago, they're going to get all of the loot from the house, from all of the people's houses and their possessions when they die. And what happened when Jesus died? A Jew. There are the soldiers at the foot of the cross. They, they gambled over his little remains. Here's his, here's his garment. It was take his wealth. But here's the deal. He didn't stay dead. He's provident. He's sovereign. He laid down his life, and he took it back again. Our reconciliation was made possible not through the bribery of supposed good deeds, which are useless, but by grace through faith in the finished work of Jesus, God's Son. Through Christ's atoning work on the cross and resurrection, our forgiveness was won. So non-Christian that's here this morning, I invite you to turn. Turn from trusting in yourself. Admit that you are a sinner and trust in the king who died for you. There's no better offer coming. There's no other offer available to atone for your sins. God has done all he can do for God. So love the world. He gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He did that for you. So I'm inviting you. Do you know this king? Is he your king? Trust him today. Repent and trust in Jesus. Christian, my brothers and sisters in Christ, consider the glory of our servant king. By God's grace, let us serve the king of love with our own hearts, overflowing with gratitude so that all will know we are Christians by our love. Listen as I close to the words of our master Matthew 20, 25 to 28, but Jesus called his disciples to himself, and this is what he said. Now think about this. Ahasuerus, Haman, Pharaoh, Joseph, all of the rulers of the world contrasted with godly rulers. You know, Jesus said, that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Verse 26. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant, your slave. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Wow. That's my king. He came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So let us trust, let us rest, 
and let us all serve in the providence of an almighty God who is king forever and ever and ever. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's stand together. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that your word is powerful, that you have this morning by your spirit taken your word and applied it to the hearts of every person here. We are all open and naked before you. Every thought, every motive, every attitude, every action, it's all on your record book. You have it all. You know it all. And yet you have loved us enough to send Jesus to die for us. So I pray, God, that as we contemplate, we think about your love, this amazing love, that each person here will have trusted in you, received this gift of love, and that we will live out our lives understanding our purpose for such a time as this, as your children to live for the glory of our King. For Jesus' sake, amen.